I'd say, you know, an A founder with a in a B market beats a B founder in an A market almost all the time. Hey everyone, this is Prashant and I'll be host for the VC 10X podcast. And today we have Dan Rosen with us. Dan is the founder and general partner at Commerce Ventures, a sector focused VC fund which invests in infrastructure and enablers for the commerce continuum. In this episode, we talk about how building a sector specific fund is different from a sector agnostic firm, difference between commerce and fintech, subsectors and trends within commerce, hosting a pitch competition at Money 2020 for startups focused on financial inclusion and a lot more. So without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. Hey Dan, so good to have you on the VC 10X podcast. How are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So to start things off, uh, can we have your story and how you started investing? So my investing story starts um, in college. When I first learned about venture capital, I was on a college uh, trip and got to visit Kleiner Perkins. Um, and an alum hosted us there, and I learned about what venture capital was. I also learned that it was uh, apparently very, very difficult to get into the venture industry. And even though it sounded super exciting and you know, kind of a thrilling job to be so close to innovators and, and helping them, um, I didn't expect it was a, a career for me, at least not anytime soon. Um, but then... As I, I graduated from college and I was working on tech consulting, actually putting large uh, lending systems into large banks, and this was in 1999 when you know kind of the world was going crazy with uh, exuberance about in the dot com era, and I was just kind of bored out of my mind, to be honest, and out of my mind to be honest, and and um, so I, I started working on a startup idea with a friend, and as we were researching potential investors. I saw at one of those investors a, a, a job opening for kind of an entry level, you know, professional, and kind of just on a whim, I, I put in an application and I figured, what could it hurt? And I ended up getting the the job offer, and so as a result, I, I realized, gosh, this was an unexpected, you know, kind of path into venture, but it was an, an industry I was really curious about, so I was excited to try and. Um, spoke with my friend and, and uh, obviously decided to proceed into venture. So that, that was my pathway in, um, a super, you know, kind of unusual one. Um, and then I never kind of left. Sounds pretty awesome. And uh, in, in, venture, in venture, like it especially, it's uh, always like that. There are like an, unexpected pathways, people coming from different backgrounds uh, into venture and then uh, doing, doing really well as well. Like uh, and take, taking you as an example, like commerce, uh, ventures uh, itself, if we uh, take a uh, talk about it, so it's uh, around uh, two hundred fifty million dollars in assets under management right now. Correct? Yep, actually a little bit more, but um, but right in that neighborhood. Yes. Got it. Cool. So, uh, can we talk about that journey of commerce ventures? Uh, when you started, why did you pick this sector, especially the commerce sector, the fintech sector, uh, and how you have grown the fund over time? Sure. Yeah. So um, my path there, I mean, you could argue it started um, back um, in college and then after school when I was working on, you know, kind of fintech, um, you know, kind of with with banks. But tr truthfully, um, I was an, an infrastructure investor for most of my early career, both at HarborVest and then later um, at Highland Capital. I was hired to really focus on um, mobile investments, starting with mobile infrastructure. As mobile data was exploding in 2006, 2007 timeframe, um, I started looking at higher layers in, in the stack, um, the intersections of mobility and mobile data with traditional industries like retail and financial services, uh, whether that be mobile couponing or next generation point of sale or mobile payments, mobile banking. And that got me super excited about the opportunity in payments. So j just innovations in payments, but but also a number of these intersection points between mobility and retail and financial services. So at Highland, I started building a practice in what was then called, you know, kind of fintech, um, which was really all about payments innovation. And it, it was very early um, in the kind of early stage investing um, area for, for fintech. So there were only a few of us who were investing uh, in that area at that time. And over the course of several years, I built out this practice and made a few investments in some early pioneers in fintech. Um, but I realized that I, my ambitions to invest in the category, um, you know, kind of exceeded the appetite of a large, more generalist platform firm like Highland to invest in, in, in the theme. And at the time, there really weren't many sector focused funds, but I believe there was an opportunity to build one. And I went to a number of the industry, you know, kind of leaders um, and, and some of the corporates that I'd gotten to know by making these sector focused investments. Um, and, you know, kind of many of them shared my enthusiasm about a sector focused investment firm. And those were really the earliest investors um, in our funds. 
And so the commerce ventures, you know, kind of seed came from, you know, my focus um, in the areas that, you know, kind of are now our focus areas, which are, you know, really infrastructure and enablers for retail and financial services. Um, we focus more on enablers and infrastructure because when I was investing in the early days of fintech, I, you know, I, I was excited about challenger models, but I realized that it was very difficult to build a startup financial services institution because the infrastructure was so difficult to work with. Um, in, in any event, uh, we, we launched, uh, I launched Commerce Ventures in February of 2013, after several months of, of fundraising, of course. And our early focus was, you know, tech for retail and financial services. And that's exactly where we focus today. So we've, we've stayed pretty consistent. Yeah, that sounds uh, pretty awesome. And we'll talk more and dig deeper into commerce and fintech. Uh, and before that, since you've worked in both these kind of funds, uh, in a sector specific fund and in a sector agnostic fund, right? So what do you think uh, are the pros and cons of both these different types of funds? Is it better to go uh, sector specific or agnostic? It's, it's difficult to compare the two. They, they serve very different functions as far as I can tell. So, um, which means they often work very well together. So in, in my experience, um, more generalist platform firms can serve a much more stage relevant focus. So they can focus on helping uh, founders and entrepreneurs move through stages um, in ways that are very um, specific. Uh, the, the help is very specific to the stage. I think sector focused firms while they can also be stage focused, I think they tend to be most successful and most helpful when they focus on helping with access to or identification of trends within the sector. So the two things actually are not mutually exclusive at all. It's possible that a sector focused fund can, you know, firm can can help um, with stage specific you know, kind of areas of help like recruiting and, um, and, and finding additional investors. Um, and it's possible that, you know, kind of generalist firms can help with sector introductions um, and, and, you know, kind of sector relevant knowledge. But that's generally the, the, the sort of the, the way that they split out is really, you know, kind of generalist firms seem to be more stage focused. Um, so they tend to be leading rounds. Um, if they are helping with, you know, kind of introductions on the BD or hiring front, um, they, they probably come from shared resources um, that are a benefit of economies of scale. Um, whereas on the sector focus side, you know, kind of the, the help tends to be driven by economies of scope. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, can we use commerce and fintech interchangeably or are these two different terms? Commerce is a bigger term than fintech. And that's the reason we, we just, we termed ourselves or we named ourselves commerce. Um, mm -hmm. When I was getting started, I thought about, you know, payments ventures or fintech ventures. But I was so fascinated by the way in which digital technologies and, you know, kind of the harnessing of electronic payments could transform the retail ecosystem that I thought it was way too limiting to call the, the firm FinTech Ventures or, or Payment Ventures. Right. And within commerce, uh, I saw on your website, there are four subsectors that you've identified and you invest in, which, which are shop, spend, save, secure, right? So Correct. what are all these four different subsectors uh, and what are the technical names for these subsectors and uh, what do they entail? Sure. Yeah. So shop is retail, spend is payments, save is banking and investing and secure is really about insurance. So if you think about a consumer, you know, or a small business and the relationship with money, these are kind of the different aspects of that relationship. Um, and so we, we, we think they're, you know, kind of inextricably linked, um, you know, kind of payments really tends to be at the core for us. It, it, it links together retail and financial services. Um, you know, the biggest players in payments, whether they be incumbents like, you know, Visa and MasterCard or Fiserv or FIS, um, or, you know, kind of some of the more large at scale challengers like Stripe or Square, um, th they have one foot in the retail ecosystem and one foot in the, the, the banking or financial services ecosystem. And so we see payments really being there at the core. Um, and it, the same is, was true as we looked across many different types of incumbents across this commerce continuum, whether they be large banks, whether they be you know, kind of wealth management and insurance companies, they tended to have involvement across multiple of those segments. And so we thought it was important to you know, kind of have coverage across the continuum in order to be able to identify important trends 
um, as well as you know, kind of many of our investments fall right at the intersection of two of these segments. If you think about you know something like um, you know kind of fraud prevention um, or you know kind of various aspects of you know retirement planning um, or you know kind of it, a number of of different investments we've made over the you know next generation bill pay, um, and these are really the interesting opportunities because they they leverage you know kind of the the focus that we have. But that continuum, you know, the holistic view of the continuum. Got it. And uh, since you are a sector specific fund, uh, I want to talk about the initial days. So at that time, how do you attract that specific deal flow uh, in the commerce sector that you only want this specific kind of companies coming to you? Uh, th does that not limit the number of uh, pitches that you get initially? So how, how did you tackle that? Yeah, I mean, I think lack of brand recognition is the the biggest limiter. Um, so, the, so first, you know, pe people needed to know that we existed and what our focus was. Um, and we didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of money to you know kind of shout that from the rooftops. So I took every opportunity there was to you know kind of speak with somebody you know kind of influential, whether that was to speak at a conference, whether that was to write you know content here and there. Um, and and so you know kind of you kind of have to use whatever you know channels you can to make you know, to build awareness. There also weren't that many startups actually focused on our, our sector, excuse me, back when I got started in 2013. It sounds silly to say that, but, you know, the number of startups in fintech and, and really commerce infrastructure have exploded over the last 10 years. So it was a little bit easier to know most of the startups, at least a lot of the credible ones. And our network um, of investors and, and just friends I think fed us a lot of great proprietary deal flow uh, in the early days. And so we were super fortunate to have that network and that those sources of deal flow, but it took a while for people to recognize our, our, our brand. And I think we're, we're very grateful that today we, um, we get a lot of emails from friends, you know, kind of where somebody requested an intro to us from them, which is, you know, the ultimate compliment. Right. That's correct. So in the initial list, uh, is it more like the investor, reaching out to the companies that you would like to invest in or or do you get significant deal flow i'm talking about the initial years like yeah years. mixture so i'd say okay. you know the, i'd say the majority of our deal flow for the first you know three or four years maybe longer was was all network driven um it was from investors of ours advisors or just friends from the industry we'd, we'd known a while again folks who knew what we were doing and understood you know kind of where I or we had expertise, um, the outbound driven sourcing was way less only because there's only so many hours in a day and there was, we had a pretty small team. It was me in the early days. And then, you know, we had um, one other investment professional for the first four years. So pretty small team. There was only so many, you know, kind of folks we could, we could reach out to. Where we did good work on um, outbound driven sourcing, it was all thesis driven. So, you know, kind of looking at interesting areas in the themes we cared about of digitizing commerce, digitizing, you know, kind of the retail experience, um, supporting next generation e-commerce, uh, you know, kind of um, different types of, you know, kind of payments opportunities, whether it be B2B payments or card issuing. And, you know, kind of that thematic research and, and speaking with those types of startups led us to several investments that we made in those areas. That's great. And you uh, talked about uh, trends uh, in the commerce sector. So uh, what do you think are the existing exciting trends uh, that you are, you're personally excited by in the commerce sector? Right now, I'm spending most of my time on things relating to credit. And I'd say, you know, kind of, there's a lot of different areas within fintech uh, to focus on. I, I spend most of my time on fintech, just to be clear, these days. And we have a broader team, so, you know, we, we sort of divide up our focuses to make life a little bit more manageable. But within fintech, I've, I've been spending a lot of time and investing um, around credit. And what I mean by that is um, the, the infrastructure that delivers, you know, kind of um, credit decisioning uh, and, and credit products to the market, um, brought, helping to broaden access to credit uh, for the average consumer or small business, and then the servicing of you know of loans once um, credit has been extended and a loan has been made. Um, I think we're in a we're in a un, inarguably a, a sort of a period of transition economically. So interest rates are obviously rising. 
we were already, you know, in a state where most of um, the American populace didn't have a lot of savings and was living paycheck to paycheck. paycheck. Um, but thanks to stimulus and, and thanks to, you know, kind of a, a relatively low unemployment rate, um, people have had money and, and, you know, kind of have chosen not many, many consumers, especially younger consumers have chosen not um, to, to take out debt, um, not to access debt um, if they could. Uh, but with inflation on the rise um, and, you know, potentially, you know, with a downturn looming um, or, or a recession looming, I think that might change. And with interest rates going up, the cost of accessing debt will be that much more expensive. So you could imagine how you could see a financial crisis if, you know, inflation rises, unemployment rises, and interest rates are go up and consumers just don't have any money, right? The average consumer doesn't have any money in the bank. So I, access to credit becomes that much more important, I think. Right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, besides, uh, since you're investing early stage, uh, what are the specific things uh, that you look for in a company while investing? Because early stage, like there, there are not a lot of metrics to look at, right? So what do you look at at that stage? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the cliche answer, which I believe as well, is, you know, founders first. Um, and, and I think about it as founders first, markets are close second. We care a lot about those two factors, especially at the very early stages. Typically, we're investing when a company has product built, even if it's just, you know, some early you know kind of product and maybe some early signals of, of product market fit. But that matters to us. And, and I can, I'm happy to explain why. Um, but for sure, at the early stages, the founder matters the most. Um, so the right. quality of the founder, you know, comes first. And then we care about, is this a, a big market opportunity? Is it an opportunity um, to be, you know, disrupting, you know, kind of um, uh, a, a large incumbent? Or is there a, you know, kind of an opportunity for rapid growth in, from a nascent position in the market? So those are the things, you know, we, we look at first and foremost. And I'd say, you know, an A founder with a, in a B market beats a B founder in an A market almost all the time. Um, because, you know, good founders find the opportunity. Um, so that, that, that's the reason for that prioritization. But we do also care about signals of, um, of product market fit and, and customer demand. So we will look, we will look for those signals as well. Um, and those, you know, there, there are some metrics around that, but, you know, kind of they vary obviously by company. Right. And let's talk about value add. Uh, uh, I think that that can be another benefit of investing in a, se a sector specific fund, right? That you can provide more specific value add to the companies that you invested in. So what are the kind of things that you help your portfolio companies with? Yep, absolutely. So we, we've built, I built the whole firm around this sector focus, um, which means our investors, many of them come with very specific, you know, kind of value to be, to be con contributed to our portfolio and to our investing practices. Um, whether those be individuals or corporates. And we have a dozen Fortune 500 corporate investors. So a big part of you know, the value add is bringing that network to bear, um, whether that, me, that, that is you know, kind of making an introduction to a potential customer or a distribution partner, or candidly just to an advisor um, or somebody who can give you know, kind of a little bit of, of um, informed um, you know, kind of feedback on, a, on an idea uh, or an opportunity that helps us with due diligence. It helps us with thematic analysis. Um, it helps our portfolio companies as they're making challenging decisions. Um, that leads me to the second piece of value add, which is really thought partnership. So we've been investing, you know, kind of all the people around, around our investment uh, group have been investing for many years in the sectors we're focused on. And, you know, our broader team has been, you know, kind of in, both investing and operating um, in these spaces. And so we bring a lot of relevance, uh, industry relevance that hopefully um, create creates, you know, kind of good thought partnership for those founders who are trying to figure out important decisions uh, and, and trying to build products that customers will love. So I'd say thought partnership, network access, um, and, you know, just generally, you know, kind of being, being, you know, kind of good, um, investment partners, um, doing the right thing, being supportive, encouraging, you know, kind of those, those, those sorts of things. It's, it's surprising how important that is and how often that gets overlooked. Um, so uh, those are probably the, yeah. the answers. Yep. Sounds great. Uh, also you recently organized, uh, an event called America's Got Access at, uh, the money 2020 event, right. Uh, and which, which was about uh, giving a hundred thousand dollar check 
to you plan to give it to one winner of the event but eventually it was given to two winners i suppose right mm -hmm. so how, how did that go and what was the event all about and how, how was it all planned out yeah so uh, we planned so uh, let me rewind a little bit we've been investing um, in companies that are aligned towards financial inclusion for several years and you know i i personally i think many people on our team have a passion um, for that opportunity. We think there's the opportunity to do good and do well at the same time by expanding access um, to financial services. And um, we had, uh, we've had the good fortune of being able to bring in, you know, kind of partners to help us um, make more of those investments, um, you know, both initial investments as well as more investments into companies in our portfolio that were on that mission. Um, and so as part of this, um, as part of this habit or activity that we we've we've been you know kind of executing on these last several years, uh, we thought about with our friends at Money Twenty Twenty how we might run a pitch competition that looked different than every other pitch competition that that Money Twenty Twenty had put on and that other conferences um, had held, and you know one the, the idea that we circled around was could we showcase companies that were focused on financial inclusion. And we have a dedicated vehicle, um, thanks to our partners, um, th that's an investment vehicle focused on these types of companies. So as, so as a result, we have the ability to, you know, kind of invest into companies that have this mission um, in a way that, you know, kind of maybe not every firm is, is, uh, is able to do. And so we thought it'd be great um, to be able to host a competition like this and have the prize at the end of it be a very company-friendly investment like the one that we we structured, uh, we we were originally targeting making one investment towards you know kind of as we got towards the event, we uh, we decided along with Money Twenty Twenty that we, we were open to the idea of there being a second investment. Um, we kept that you know kind of under wraps because we thought you know it would be you know kind of a, a more interesting and um, exciting experience um, if we could you know kind of uh, I guess surprise folks with that at the end, um, which I, I think was a lot of fun to do. And I'm, I'm just super excited about the companies that we've gotten a chance to invest in through that competition. But I'll tell you the, the hardest part about the competition was, you know, we had, you know, kind of well north of 150 applicants. Um, very, very many of them were, um, were, were high quality applicants. And we had to narrow that down to 10 semifinalists uh, to, to invite to the event. That was difficult. And then from the 10, getting down to, you know, kind of five finalists was way harder. And, you know, kind of, I would have been, I think we would have been very happy and proud to be an investor in any one of those five finalists. Um, and so, you know, kind of, it, it was a difficult decision um, for the judges. It wasn't just myself. Uh, it was, it was the, the judging group. It was a difficult decision to, you know, kind of get down to the, the final winner. Um, and, you know, we got some great audience participation as well that helped us um, with selection of, of having a second, not just a first. So, but fantastic businesses, uh, Zertu and, and uh, Remint. So we're super excited to be working with those founders. Um, so I think it was a success. Uh, I'm excited about yeah. it. And hopefully we get to do it again. Absolutely. Sounds, sounds pretty interesting. Uh, now, th this will be my last main question to you before I move on to my quick rapid fire questions uh, at the end. So, uh, my last main question is, uh, on, your, on your website, it says that you have 50 plus strategic LPs. Uh, so wh what, is that, what does strategic LPs mean and uh, how do they add value to founders? Sure. Yeah, so, so there's two categories of strategic LPs. There's strategic individuals and, and corporate LPs. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, a dozen Fortune 500 um, LPs uh, or investors uh, in our funds, and we have you know, dozens and dozens of strategic individuals. The individuals have run companies like PayPal and CyberSource and CheckFree and Fiserv and Global Payments. And the list kind of goes on and on. And um, so the experience of these successful founders and senior executives um, is invaluable as we try to decide interesting, you know, kind of themes to explore in, inside of the commerce continuum, but also as we're, you know, kind of undergoing due diligence, you know, kind of in an area um, we're looking for, when we're looking for advisors um, and candidly, some of them end up 
joining our companies either as executives, uh, as board members, or you know may even found companies that we invest in. So um, the strategic individual network is the you know kind of is is a gift that keeps on giving. And I say I would say the corporate strategic side, you know, kind of does so, but in different ways. Uh, they are a source of a very substantial amount of capital, um, where we have you know fantastic, more structured thought partnerships. So we're talking with them routinely in a way that helps feed our knowledge of opportunities um, and drawbacks uh, in terms of investment themes. Um, so we work closely with them on themes. We we. Um, gather, you know, kind of market requirements, if you will, of areas that are not being well served. Uh, we, they help us with due diligence and, you know, kind of as we make investments, they become really interesting potential customers and even partners in many cases to our companies. So when we say strategic, that's, that's kind of what we mean. Uh, we, we have close relationships with all of our investors um, and, we, you know, we, we are grateful for all of their support. But the way in which a corporate or a strategic individual, you know, kind of help is very different than the way in which a financial investor helps. Fascinating. I agree with that. So now let's move on to uh, the closing questions, which will be the rapid fire round. So I have five questions uh, for you, which are all about the fund. And you have to give five quick answers. Are we ready for it? Sure. All right. So the first one goes, uh, what are the sectors and regions you invest in? I, I know the sector, but you can go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we invest in technology for retail and financial services. Broadly speaking, we invest um, in the U.S. Uh, a lot of our core investments go into the U.S., but we'll we'll make investments in emerging markets. We have several in Latin America as well as uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, a few in Africa. Um, but by and large, in the U.S. has been the majority of our, our investments historically. Great. And what's the typical stage of investment? Most of our investments will go into seed or Series A. Okay, and what's the typical check size? Uh, that ranges from on the low end, 250K, let's say, all the way up to $2 million. But the average probably is in the 500,000 to a million dollars for a first investment. Our subsequent investments can actually be substantially larger. Okay, and uh, where can founders pitch you in case there's a direct way? Sure, um, I, I think we have, uh, a, an email on the website that people um, can use, but I'm just dan at commerce.vc. So if somebody wants to send me information, that's probably faster. Yeah, I love it when they did, like investors directly put out their emails. Okay, last one. Uh, where can our listeners follow you? Uh, so I am at Venture Dan on Twitter. Uh, hopefully the new Twitter ownership doesn't change <laughs> the way in which we use that platform. Um, and uh, LinkedIn is also another great resource for finding me. Great. Well, Dan, it was great talking to you. I love the work that you're doing at Commerce VC and all the best for what you do ahead and happy investing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Prashad. Pleasure.